<laughs> All okay. right. Awesome. So I know others will be joining us in a little bit. I wanted to just um, take a moment to say, wow, welcome to all of you. And uh, we are here uh, for a, lo a lot of really important reasons, but one of the most important reasons is to support and, and be a strong partner with the Black-Owned Business Excellence um, Movement. And so Jennifer Ness, has been really kind of this powerful catalyst in organizing partners to support black owned businesses, encourage um, partners to put on events like this so that all businesses have equitable access to the resources that really need to be there for small businesses. So my name is Lisa Smith. I work with a nonprofit called the Washington State Micro Enterprise Association. And like our goal every single day is to support organizations that serve the smallest businesses, rural businesses, businesses owned by people with limited incomes, owned by people with disabilities, black owned, indigenous owned, owned by all sorts of people, but really the smallest. And what we know is that unless these, these businesses have equitable access to business training, technical assistance, financing and microloans, we're never going to have equity in the economic development sphere. So that's why we're here. And we have these amazing speakers who are going to share a little bit about what they do every day to help the smallest organ businesses grow. And then we're going to have a bunch of questions just to help kind of um, all of us better understand what resources are available and how to think through finances what we know is that when we uh, track our finances regularly, we have a better sense of the health of our business. Doing taxes is easier. Applying for federal grants and loans is easier. Everything's easier if we have that courage to be clear on what our finances are. And these experts speaking today are gonna just be rock stars in kind of laying out the options that we all have. Uh, but before we begin, I just wanna say, um, Thank you to the Department of Commerce. They have funded us to help uh, do these kinds of events. So that's really important. Um, and also just to know that all of you, no matter where you are, there's a likely a micro enterprise development organization near you. So um, what I wanna do just for a minute is kind of point you to our website. And I don't know if Sheree, if you can put that in the, in the chat or share screen, but all of you can go to WSMA and if you, this is our website and she's gonna put the link in our website. If you go to where it says partners, in here are organizations that just work with limited income and other organizations around the state. And although this is a very hard map to read, um, if you have any questions, any links you wanna get, any connections you wanna make, you're welcome to connect with me or go straight to these organizations. And, um, so four of them are on this, on this call and on this webinar. Um, we're very fortunate to have Jennifer Ness, who's a small business development director partner. And uh, so super exciting to have you, Jennifer Ness. Um, and then we have Beto Yarse, who's the executive director of Ventures. We have Marisa Phillips, who's with the Business Impact Northwest. And then we're very fortunate to have Anthony Burnett and Cecile, I'm so sorry here, hold on. And Cecile um, Nguyen, forgive me, how do you pronounce right. it? Nguyen. Nguyen, uh, as co-presenters, I'm sorry, for uh, Taper 100. So any questions before we go further? Lovely. Okay, so if you're not presenting, you're, you're welcome to um, uh, close your video. We wanna say thank you to all of you for coming. And I'm going to um, introduce Jennifer Ness. So this incredible human uh, is really a part of the spear, tip of the spear of equity in the economic development movement. She's been coaching, educating, training entrepreneurs for over 18 years. She works at the SBDC and started here in 2018 
actually uh, by way of Columbus, Ohio, where she was also an S SBDC director. So Jennifer Ness is not just a business technical advisor. She is a author of several books. She's a lifetime learner. She has had several awards, Martin Luther King Distinguished Service Award, among others. And she's really the life blood of so many businesses in our region who have gotten support, have gotten hope, and um, the kind of technical expertise that businesses need, whether they're the startup or the advanced businesses ready to grow to the, a new location. We are really fortunate to welcome Jennifer S. Tucker, who is going to take the first leg of our panelist discussion. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, thank you guys for being here. It's amazing to have you all on a Tuesday afternoon. I will say that I am not the um, director of the oh. Washington Small Business Development Center. I am actually a certified business advisor. And there are 30 of us across the state of Washington. And so if you're interested in getting a small business development center certified business advisor, I'm going to drop the link in the chat for you guys to be able to do so. Um, I, another thing I want to say is that I am from Ohio, O-H-I-O, -O, for anybody else that's from Ohio, but I work <laughs> at the Connecticut Small Business Development Center. So in Ohio, I ran my own business um, full time and I worked with the Ohio Small Business Development Center. So I wanted to correct that because I know folks are going to be watching this and I'm be like, what? When that happen? So just correct that so that we have it on record. I'm a certified business advisor. All right. Thank you, okay, Jennifer good. Ness. Somebody's having trouble hearing. Is anyone else unable to hear? Are you good, Lisa? Can you hear me? You're doing great. Okay. Thank you okay, for that correction. Amber. All right, Amber, I would just log off and log back on just so you can hear everything, but also know that this is being recorded so you can go back and listen to it. Oh, I don't know. All right, so we're going to move on. What I'm here to talk about today is credibility. We know that in, um, what was that, 2020, when COVID first hit, uh, it was just super duper crazy where a lot of time, a lot of people had a lot of benefits available. They had all types of resources available. And we know that our folks didn't get access to it. And so we don't make excuses, right? We don't look backwards. We're not crying over spilled milk. But what we do want to look at is solutions. And one of the solutions that I think would help us to position ourselves to be in the recipients of some of these things that are available is to make sure that we have credibility, okay? So sustainable businesses with credibility. That was one of the issues that I saw with a lot of my clients and also a lot of my colleagues saw with their clients. The credibility was an issue. And so let me just talk a little bit about statistics, you know, because statistics don't lie, right? So let's look at some data points. Check these out. I'm going to put them on this screen periodically. But let me just say that the CARES Act, oh, excuse me, the CARES Act of 2020 gave out $5.2 million, okay? And I'm sorry, 5.2 million loans that were worth $525 billion. And a lot of that didn't go to our community. And so the reason why I talk about this and the reason why people think that I'm a champion is because when I hear BIPOC, I automatically think of Black-owned business. I want Black-owned businesses to be excellent. In order for us to be ex excellent, we have to focus on the things that make us excellent, okay? So one of those things is access to capital. So we're going to talk about that today. I'm going to stop my video because I want y'all to be able to hear me and not so much see me because it goes lagging. So anyways, let me tell you a little bit about me. I see a lot of folks in the line that I already know. And I'm happy to see so many familiar faces. Uh, Christina, Bash, Jay, Taj, all of y'all good folks. But let me just say that I'm an educator. I love to teach. I work at the Washington Small Business Development Center. And I also teach at Seattle Central. I teach economics and entrepreneurship. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna make this really, really fast. 
Um, I'm a small business owner since 2009. I'm a financial coach and author. Yes. I have six revenue streams. And the reason why I'm saying that is because three of them are passive. And I want you guys as entrepreneurs to start thinking about passive revenue streams. But my pride and joy are these two beautiful and handsome children right here. Those are mine, <laughs> all mine. I made them, okay? So that is a little bit about me. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about Let's talk a little bit about personal versus business credit, and I'm gonna leave it up to the other folks on the panel. But then I'm gonna give you guys some bonuses in the presentation that Lisa sends out to you. There'll be a lot of bonuses in there. So I want you to think differently about capital infusion and also think differently about how to make your business credible. Why business credit? I'll tell you a little bit about one of my clients. She had a, a natural hair care business and she got into Sally's and Walmart. And then she had a capacity issue. She had a manufacturing that increased. She had all these POs coming at her and she could not supply. So that's why she needed credit. And it's probably why a lot of you may need credit because it helps you with cash flow, working capital, expanding and sustainability of your business and also bam, credibility, okay? So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, here's some of the reasons why loans are denied. And I believe some other folks on the panel is gonna go deeper but I just want to mention these things, insufficient credit, personal guarantee, and delinquent and past credit. So the wrong business formation can stop you from getting contract certifications and awards. I'm not going to dig deep into this, but I will say that there's a major difference between personal versus business credit. If you need some additional help, I'm willing to help you and help this break this down. I put it in the presentation so you all can see it and know that when we get to the question and answers, you can ask me some questions if you'd like, okay? So bottom line, credibility is key. Nobody knows you from the next person on the block, right? So you have to have a credible business. So there are seven credibility factors. I'm gonna go through them rather quickly. Again, I have seven minutes, but I want you to take notes, take a picture. The very first credibility factor is your EIN number, right? So you go and you go to the IRS, you establish your business as the federal, through the federal government, irs.gov. You got to have an EIN number. That's what separates you from your business, separates you from using your social security number. You use the EIN number. The next credibility number is your Dun and Bradstreet number. This is super duper important because this separates you from uh, Tamika Care Care in Seattle from Tamika Care Care in Columbus, Ohio. So your DUNS number is another very important number, credibility factor. The third one is a business phone number. Now, you can definitely use your personal cell phone as you want to, but you need this number to be consistent over every single platform so they know when they're looking for you, they have the absolute correct number, okay? The next number is, I'm sorry, the next credibility factor is your business website and your email. So it's just super duper important for you to have an email that is different from jennifines at gmail.com. Instead, you should have hello at jennifines.com. That's a business email and that's a credibility factor. Also, your, your website, even if your website, domain name, links to your backs to your social media, you have to have this as a credibility factor because that is the way people will be able to differentiate you from a credible business, okay? okay. Then there's number five, a business banking account. I can't say this enough, and I want you guys to repeat after me. And when I say repeat after me, I'm not talking about unmute yourself. I'm saying type it in the chat box. Do not co-mingle funds. That's what I need to see right now. I need to see, it's 39 people on here. I need to see that at least 30 times right now in the chat box. Do not co-mingle funds. The reason why this is so important, guys, is because nobody wants to give you money to fund your lifestyle. Nobody wants to give you money that is for your personal gain. They want to give you money for your business if they're going to give you money. So when you're co-mingling funds in a bank or a lender or any type of funder doesn't know whether you and the bank are the same, that's problematic. Okay. So you have to have a business banking account, okay? Oh, okay? So please mute yourself. Cause I don't like to be interrupted. Um, and I got a, I only got a short period of time. Lisa gonna cut me off. Okay. So listen here, mute yourself. All right. Now credibility, not factor number six. Let's talk about it. 
This is number six, business financials. Some people get intimidated by this, but it's not anything to intimidate you. There's going to be three business financials that folks are going to look for at any time to tell they're going to want to see your profit and loss statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement. These are simple things for you to get. You can do that. You don't have to know QuickBooks to do that. You can do it through Excel. You can also do it through an app called Wave Apps, and it's free. So make sure that you have business financials because that shows that you are credible, okay? Then the last credibility factor is your social media presence and your reviews. This is important. Oftentimes, people will go and look at your reviews before they even go to your website. OK, this is just how consumers make purchases nowadays. So make sure that you have reviews and your social media is up to date. Just the other day, I was riding in a neighborhood and I wanted some vegan food. And so I Googled, you know, vegan near me and I go to their social media. And the last post they made was like January of 2020. I don't even know if that business is open. Right. So I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time. And I'm not saying update your social media every single day, but it definitely needs to be relevant and and it needs to be up to date for you to have a credibility factor number seven, okay? So once you have these credibility factors, things change, right? So you have to be able to maintain them. Maintaining them is key, okay? So I am at my time limit. So I wanna make sure I respect uh, the fact that Lisa has given me this time. I will be here to answer any questions. <laughs> that you all have. And again, I have this presentation for you that I'm gonna, that Lisa's gonna pass out. And there's a whole bunch of bonuses in there too. Thank you for the snacks. Okay, thank you. Who's that, Jay? Jay, listen, okay, before I turn it over to Lisa, I thank you for that. Thank you for keeping your camera on and giving me that energy and let me see you snap, cause I love it, okay? In addition to that snap, remember I told you one of the credibility factors is, right? The reviews. So I'm gonna put a link in there right now, bam. Make sure you leave that review. Leave that snap on paper, baby, because them reviews are worth more than money and tips nowadays, okay? So leave me a review. That's not just for Jay. That's for everybody. Awesome. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa. <laughs> Let's give her a round of applause. Go on. Awesome. Beautiful Thank job. Thank you. So that was powerful and why that is so relevant is that unless you can become operational as a business you're going to be it's going to be harder for you to make a profit and be sustainable and so the next uh incredible presenter on our panel is Beto Yarse who is the executive director of Ventures okay this guy this human uh is incredible and I've known him for years he's one of our core um, micro enterprise development organizations in the state. And Beto is a serial entrepreneur. He started a candy store um, when he was like eight years old, his first bout of uh, entrepreneurship. But Beto is responsible for maintaining community engagement, promoting ventures mission, marketing, and securing new funding and sources uh, to support the work. Um, he works to set organizational culture. He leads his staff to accomplish the organization's mission, uh, adhere to core values and maintain positive work environment. And I just want to do a little uh, plug here. Ventures kicked is kicking proverbial um, work in the legislature right now to get the tamale bill passed. And I am in awe of your whole team, Beto. I also want to say that uh, when Beto started his business in Seattle, he didn't have access to the resources that he is now providing with ventures, along with many other micro enterprise development organizations in the state. And so um, he's been the executive director since 2014. And without further ado, I want to welcome Beto Yarsay. Thank you, Lisa, for the wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. Muy buenas tardes. Spanish is my first language, so I always like to acknowledge that. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. It's very kind of hard to follow that excitement that Jennifer has just started and kick us off. Uh, but I'm here to just share a little bit of the knowledge that ventures have with all of you and how can we support you. So uh, as Lisa mentioned, we are, uh, this is my introduction. So here's my email and you will get all that information. Uh, but the, here is our mission and guiding values. 
So ventures empower entrepreneurs with limited resources and unlimited potential to improve their lives through small business ownership. Through the years, we've been building these values through community, client success, empowerment, integrity, diversity, and innovation. I always like to focus on client success because that's what I've been doing this work for 13 years because my whole goal is how we help our clients to succeed. And then who do we serve? Six, uh, we serve about 600 individuals per year. An average client support a family of $20,000 per year in the King County and the Homish County area. In terms of the demographics of who we serve is 75% of our clients are women, 65% are people of color, 35% are immigrants or refugees, and 30% are Spanish speakers. I'm very uh, proud to be able to create the Spanish program. I'm the founder of the program Spanish. So here is how do we support our clients. Uh, so if you focus on the center in purple is business basic course. So that's how we started on creating a business plan. So how can you put together a business plan for marketing, financial and operations? After you graduate from this business basic course, you can get access to all the programs that ventures offer. So what I call a la carte. So you can see capital hit on the bottom. I always call that is the cherry on the, on the top of the cake because capital is so important as Jennifer was sharing early on. But if you don't have uh, your business plan together, you don't have your business uh, your business incubation or at least try the market before, or you don't have a good marketing plan or financial literacy, it's going to be very hard that you get access to capital. So what Ventures does is creating technical assistance, uh, they wrap up services in that way you can succeed. And then with a lot of coaching and one-on-one -on -one support. So the business and financial checklist. So this is something that I wanna share with all of you about what is important for you to know when you are preparing to get access to capital. So most lenders like or traditional like a bank or mission driven lenders like Ventures will ask you for a checklist of documents before appro approving your loan. So this is what I wanna share you what is important to, to be ready for that. So the checklist for us, it will be, what is my motivation for borrowing? So I will always start out questions. Why do I want to borrow money? Why do I want to get in debt? So what is the stage of my business? So startups, for example, or business that they are about to start. When you start a business, you are going to need a lot of money to start with supplies, space, equipment, and a loan can help you to pay for all of that. Uh, but you need to be make sure that you are ready for that. Uh, entrepreneurs likely need to outside sources for income of resources to get approved from a loan from a traditional lender. Ask yourself, what other sources of income can you show to demonstrate your repayment ability? So do you have a full-time job? Do you have some savings? Do you have a property that you are renting that you can provide that? So it's very important that you start thinking how I'm gonna pay for that loan. Existing business, it's time to start a new program in your business or expansion, a reach to more customers, open a new location. It's very exciting when we are more established as a business and we're thinking, how do we can make more impact? How do I grow my business? So definitely access to capital, a business loan can help you to put everything that you need for that expansion, but find your business profit and loss. So it's very important that when you are thinking expansion, so how you put your financials in order. So many times I see that people don't think about that. They just start thinking, I want to ask for a loan, but they don't have their financial statements in order. And nobody is going to take you serious, as Jennifer is saying, if you are not thinking and considering about what is the healthy financial statements that I have of my business. And don't get intimidated. Financials is very hard in a small business. I own several businesses over all my life. And financials is the last thing that I like. I like the marketing. I like the sales. I like the connection with the people. I like to design jewelry when I was designing. And financials was my last excitement. But it's very important because if not, you cannot expand and grow. Uh, so what is, what is my motivation for borrowing? So why I want to go for a loan? What is this loan for? So inventory. <laughs> So do I want to have, buy more inventory to my business? 
do I want to buy equipment that will help me with efficiencies on my on my business? Uh, sometimes the equipment you purchase with a loan can also act as a collateral to secure the loan. So I have seen this model work very well in the past that you can buy a, a equipment that can be secure and then it's an easy way for us to, uh, to approve the loan. I see June uh, raise his hand and I will hold that for a minute while I finish my presentation and hopefully we can go and answer that question. And, or no, if no, you can answer the, you can put the question on the chat. Just wanna uh, see that I see that. Uh, working capital. Uh, working capital loan help finance day-to-day -day operation while you expand your business uh, and smooth cash flow challenges. So sometimes we need money to make sure the business is still operating and our cash flow is lean and we know that we're going to receive the funds later on. So, but it needs to be very important that you understand what is that ask. What is my motivation for borrowing? Take time for checking with yourself. It's very important. This is a new opportunity of the latest FAD. If you are taking on the finance new business opportunity, take time for due diligence. Make sure your investment will yield long-term value for your company. It's not just a short excitement. Entrepreneurs get very excited and we get very like, oh my God, this is the new trend. I want to jump into the wagon. I'm super excited to develop this new jewelry collection or I'm gonna open this new coffee shop because I'm very excited, but that can put your business in, in trouble. Um, I might understand credit pressure. So if your current loans and line of credits are maxed out, maybe it's not the right time for you to ask for a loan is maybe you just need to work with a business coach or a financial coach to support you on how do you get out of that debt and really do a, what is the financial analysis that you need to do. Am I borrowing to bail out of my business? Loans are tools to help business growth. Uh, if you are borrowing money to keep the doors open, it's time to consider all the reasons your business is struggling. Can a loan really help you to succeed if you don't change the structure of your business? Sometimes it's very hard to make decisions on when that business is not really feasible or when we need to close the door. And it's very hard. I have made those decisions before. It's very challenging, but it's better to just unplug the cable sometimes and move on than continue getting ourselves into a more debt. Uh, is it is a time right? When do I need the money? So it's very important. Sometimes the money we need it by yesterday. And if you don't act and efficiency, so the money is not going to come. Long processes can take time. The good money that is out there take time. You can get approved in 24 hours for a predatory lender, but don't touch those because they are, if you touch some of those lens, loans, it's going to be very hard for you to recover. I need the money last week. So that's what I was thinking, like urgency. In two or three months, ideally, will we get the loans due ahead of the time? you plan to use the money with enough time to put it in work for you? Many small business loans can take, as I say, eight to 12 weeks to process and complete. So adventures were trying to simplify our process and expedite the process, but it's still on that. It takes time. Uh, so if you need more information, here's the, the information on how you can you participate on our program. And I know that this will be shared with all of you. And thank you very much for, for listening and your time. And I don't know if this is the right time to answer questions, Lisa. I will let you know, leave this. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so let's give him a round of applause. You can give him an emoji. Beautiful job, Beto. I know you could have gone on forever and ever. And, but what's really powerful is just the, the framework that you laid out um, about the resources that you provide. So beautifully done. There was a, a quick question um, from June about whether you provide small grants and you're welcome to, to answer that quickly. And I know there'll be an opportunity later on as well. So if I'm understanding correctly, the question is like, if we help to promote businesses in our community adventures? Um, the question is, um, she knows that there's loans available, but are there, are there micro grants? Yes. Do you offer micro grants? We just started last year. That's a new trend. That's something that we just start working with the challenges of COVID. Uh, we fundraised more than a million dollars last year and that's what we distributed last year in micro grants. Exactly. Um, it's been, 
very interesting on how do we do that was not part of our strategy plan. That was not part of what we were thinking because we've been just being a CDFI and a traditional lender. But I've been advocating for years, even before COVID, that in order for the entrepreneurs that we serve to get really up and speed, they need a grant, they don't need a loan. So we are planning to put together a, a long-term plan of like starting with a grant and then you can we can help you with all the technical assistance and the training and coaching to get you ready for a loan so that's what we're building i will try to achieve that in the next three to five years and then i'm having a lot of conversations with federal government and local governments to do that so it takes time but i think finally people are listening about what is important on micro enterprise and and then the populations that we serve so yes we are offering grants you need to be part of the ventures community and get to get access to those micro grants but um so i'm sorry if i uh, take in more of the time but that was just, beautiful thank you like, no problem yeah and it was a great question june thank you um very much for that and an excellent answer i do know um that we have two more speakers i'd like to introduce um risa next if that's all right um so um, Marisa Phillips is the Loan Readiness Officer at Business Impact Northwest. We're so grateful that you're here today and sharing your presentation with us. Um, Marisa is a Portland native and passionate about the community, and she is really responsible for developing and providing loan readiness training for folks who come through Business Impact Northwest um, and helping them take actions on getting creditworthiness, improving their projections, cleaning up their bookkeeping, receiving credit counseling, and many, many other priorities. Um, I'll say the Business Impact Northwest uh, does lending all over the state. In fact, I think four states, um, they have programs for veterans and are really um, doing a, a significant number of uh, loans right now. And I think Beto, you also do um, PPP loans. We did not do PP loan, but we help people to start uh, how to apply for a PP loan. Okay, great. And so Business Impact Northwest is another partner who does that. Um, and so without further ado, welcome to Marisa Phillips of Business Impact Northwest. Thank you for having me. Welcome. So I, am, I am newly to Business Impact Northwest. It's a wonderful company. You know, we our target clients are entrepreneurs who have been excluded from the economic mainstream and cannot obtain credit from a, a, a traditional financial institution. Um, in particular, um, our clients are women, people of color, veterans, and immigrant-owned businesses in Washington and Oregon. We do provide all kinds of loan types, including revolving lines of credits, microloans, commercial real estate loans, on a case-to-case -case basis, in addition, other alternative loans as well. We like to focus on the five um, Cs, which is uh, character, capability, I'm sorry, ca <laughs> um, cash flow, capital, and collateral. Um, these are all important factors to determine if the client is prepared to open and run successful businesses. That way we're not setting them up for failure. We do provide several loan types. They run from one year to seven years. They can range from an 8% interest rate all the way up to 11% with the minimum amount of 5,000 with the max amount of $350,000. Um, these loans uh, tend to be used for equipment, inventory, cash flow, debit restructuring, um, permanent working capital, owner occupancy, commercial or mixed use real estate. We also offer additional resources as, uh, as in the loan readiness resources, a meeting with a business advisor, preparing documentation for loan applications and lending navigation tools. I hope this provides you a with a great sense of service that Business Impact Northwest offers in support of setting the scale to uplift the community. Thank you for having me. We will do look forward to working with all. Thank you, Maritza. And I know you're gonna be available for the question and answer um, process. Um, I also wanna just 
uh, say how much I appreciate your whole team. You've got an amazing network of folks that I've been fortunate to work with. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, move now to Tabor 100. And I, I just want to say, talk about humans who can turn on a dime. We have two presenters who are going to be sharing the Tabor 100 story. And I, um, unfortunately, Ollie Garrett wasn't able to join us today. And so I'm very glad to introduce Anthony Burnett and Cecile Nguyen. And uh, Anthony is a board member of Tabor 100. He's also the principal owner of MB Diversity LLC. And they focus on staffing, recruiting, and managing project resources. Um, his background includes business development and account management uh, in a private sector for multi Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he was born and raised in Southern California and uh, just is a really an amazing resource here in Washington State. And Cecile, um, she's from California, born in Silicon Valley, raised in Northern California, attended UC Davis and completed her master's program at Dominican University in California in Marin. Now she's in um, Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, she leverages over 20 years of experience in banking and financial services and empowers her clients uh, with financial education through the financial planning process. So I just wanna say welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. Um, both of you for presenting. I know we have your PowerPoint here. And so without further ado, let's welcome these two beautiful humans from Table 100. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you so much for having us as a um, member and uh, somebody who's been a part of the board for years. It's always great to uh, be a part of these panels because we get to reach so people just we can't. Or... Oh, everyone needs to mute, thank you. So uh, what I was saying is it's always great to go ahead and reach out to the community, reach out to individuals, reach out to business owners because we, the business owners make up uh, what Tabor is and who we looking to serve. But I just wanted to take, what I will do is I'll do a quick intro about Tabor for those who don't know, um, talk about some new developments, and then I'm gonna transition it over to Cecile Nguyen so she can start, start speaking about some of the um, programs that Tabor has and then also speak about our experiences and how we've been able to leverage Tabor to gain business opportunities. Cause I think that's also um, what we're all here to do as well. So uh, without further ado, first slide, please. Hello, okay. All right, great. Um, that's the Tabor mission, but um, for those who don't know, uh, Tabor serves um, Southern uh, Seattle and Seattle communities, mainly people of color and advocate uh, for them and not only economic empowerment, but educa continued education and contract development. Um, what Tabor started off was uh, Lynx and Tabor in 1998, uh, they were passing you know, I-200 and he understood the community impact that was going to take place uh, if it was passed. Unfortunately, it was passed and immediately the African-American businesses um, completely declined and uh, was cannibalized, uh, honestly, you know, as far as con contracting opportunities. He wanted to get a place where all people could come together, learn, um, have all the administrative help needs, all that good stuff in one particular location and an organization that uh, wanted to help that because it was through repeal the I-200. Unfortunately, he passed um, and the people who cared about him, loved him and shared his same mission said, why don't we go ahead and start a nonprofit in the name of um, Links and Tabor. So that's when Tabor 100 was originated. Um, it's been going on since 1998. So just past uh, 20 some odd years. And um, right now it's doing very well. Um, our membership is, oh, next slide please, I'm sorry. Um, but what Tabor 100, uh, membership is 250 uh, current members and steadily growing. But the basis of Tabor is to make sure we are empowering local business owners, advocating for the opportunities and um, helping them with connections and network. Um, one of the key things, and the next slide please, one of the key things that um, the board talked about yesterday, well not yesterday, I'm sorry, years ago, <laughs> was there needs to be one isolated location 
um, where we can come together and answer those hard questions. Um, today it's financial, but also administrative, uh, marketing, networks. How do we come together and get more contracts? So that's what the idea or the basis of the Tabor Economic Development Hub is. It's located in, uh, in an old um, University of Phoenix building. We renovated it. We've done some amazing work with it. And it is open. Um, and the key is to come around and join together to go after different contracts. So um, that is what the hub is. It uh, started about a year ago. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, you know, we had to reduce some of the uh, capacity, but we are starting to see more people come in and more contracts are being signed. Uh, next slide, please. But with that said, because of COVID and because of other things, we understand the challenges that black businesses have, right? We have a higher fail rate um, than other businesses, um, startup resources that usually are not there, um, barriers, and then discrimination in, in contracting. Some people don't wanna just simply use us. So with those networks, we are able to go ahead and come together and, and help uh, those businesses. As a business development chairperson, I can proudly say that I've personally helped um, several business make money. And that's the biggest thing. How do I get contracts? And being able to get them to the right person and have the right conversation to develop that business and to grow. Maybe it's a small business, uh, maybe it's a medium-sized business. All businesses can grow. And that's, again, one of the missions, missions that Tabor is addressing with some of the challenges that uh, we have as Black businesses. Next slide, please. Okay. And I'll be wrapping it up shortly here. Um, of course, COVID, you know, the, the elephant in the room has affected many Black businesses, okay? Black-owned businesses are now just going everywhere as far as, you know, should I stay, should I go? They're declined for um, small business loans and the PPE received was less than 2%. And a PPP heat is, is, it's a problem. So what Tabor has done is address that and removed a lot of the red tape. Yes, next slide, please. So therefore businesses can get the, the support they need through grants and other resources and um, be able to sustain you know, the hit that COVID has, but look at it as an opportunity to grow. And with that said, um, I'm gonna go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I got one more slide. And I'm gonna talk about MB and what Tabor has done. Because we started in uh, MB, we were able to get our first large city contract. When we first got our first city contract, uh, we would just had contractors. We didn't know anything about what we needed um, as far as financial is concerned. What's gonna be the best? Do we get a loan? Do we go factoring? Do we do all these things? And even though you know these are some jobs that change lives, it really put a burden on us and not having those frank conversations. What Tabor was able to do for me was get me to the right person and the right people that so walked me through how I can go ahead and sustain my financial, uh, my finances so I could go ahead and grow my business. It's grown tremendously and, and I'm thankful for Tabor, not as necessarily a commercial, but it, it is a network that's ready to support and help black businesses, but not only as far as development of the business, but also um, economic funds. So Cecile, uh, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so um, I'm actually, uh, uh, I have a few offices here within the Tabor Hub. And I can tell you right now that as we're, we've reopened, just any single person who comes by, if you see my door open, come in, let's have a conversation and let's find out where we can help you grow from there and where we really need to find that grant money for you. Um, in speaking about grant money, the Black Business Equity Fund, um, this is a specific fund. It's an assembly of money earmarked specifically for black owned businesses with little to no red tape or little to minimal red tape for, qualify, uh, for qualifying and for funding. Um, this is um, in comparison to the PPP and the IDLE is really meant to help be that resource for rebuilding and recovery for um, black owned businesses, right? The key to this is that the money that you're being granted needs to be applied for sustainable change. What does that mean? Sustainable change in terms of, um, oh, thank you, Lisa. Um, sustainable change in terms of um, 
uh, infrastructure for your business, for um, hiring on new bodies into your business, things that will create a ripple effect in the community around you, right? The BBEF launched um, with a steering committee that mostly comprised of local corporate leaders, community organizations like Tabor 100, elected officials and other stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. So what is our goal over at Tabor? Our goal is um, in, ter in terms of helping out black owned businesses, right? We're looking at a minimum of $1.5 million a year uh, for the next three years. That's $750,000 in cash grants, $750,000 for capacity towards building training, technical assistance and programming for these small businesses. And we wanna look at doing that through um, um, through our community here. So cash grants, black owned businesses like cash grants through the BBEF, uh, Comcast Rise, uh, City of Seattle um, and King County grants, right? Training, technical assistance and programming. We have um, here at the hub, we've got um, OMWBE has an office here. City of Seattle has an office here. We have Seattle Credit Union has an office here. So these are people that you can tap for, oh, as well as my, my offices, Navigator Advisors, tap for assistance, right? If you're trying to get your certifications, if you're trying to get um, help filling out the application for any of these grants, we're all here to help out. Um, and then organizational capacity um, building is how do we build a stronger, better organization, better small business so that you can survive and thrive through the next ordeal? Or maybe it's not a global pandemic, maybe it's something else, right? Um, scroll down, please. Um, so Tabor 100 is also looking towards the future. We're looking at offering, uh, we have offered um, scholarships. Um, the University of Washington Bradford Scholarship is for um, students and graduates out of University of Washington going in or going into the University of Washington, helping them pay for um, those students pay for tuition books, etc. Right. And those primarily go towards um, kids who are um, uh, minority or um, disadvantaged communities. Um, the Green Energy Scholarship. Um, the Green Energy Scholarship is pretty much what it is, uh, it, it, what it sounds like. Um, it goes towards those who are looking to build a career in the green energy field. Um, and then the WSCC Hospitality and Culinary Scholarships is where um, if you're as a student looking to um, move forward in um, hospitality and the culinary arts um, and becoming a chef, then this scholarship is here to help you pay for the um, education and tools related to that. Um, and then Mel Streeter and Pemco scholarships last year, we gave those out, uh, I believe it was the first time that we did the Mel Streeter. So I'm not very, very familiar with that one, but I can get some information for you guys. And then the PEMCO scholarship um, is also there for uh, incoming students to university. And we're gonna, we're actually gonna skip that um, because that was our 10 minutes. Anybody have any questions for us? Beautifully done. Okay, great. Round of applause. Can you all um, open up your screens, let us see your faces, and give every one of these speakers a round of applause. Thank you for your, not just your presentation, but for all of your work every day, day in and day out. Take a look at that. I hope we can get a picture of all your mugs there. Um, so what I want to just say is, um, the work of being in business is Herculean. It's hard and it takes a lot of time and it takes courage to price what you're worth, to become credible like Jenna Vanessa had said about making sure you have all of your, your credibility, your, your email, your DUNS number, your EIN, to make sure you understand why you would get financing from Beto and 
Understand the training and technical assistance you need to do. How to prepare for financing from Marisa with Business Impact Northwest and really think through not only what you need to do to prepare for financing, but what are you going to use the money for and how you're going to pay it back. And finally, you know, the gifts from Anthony and Cecile is like, so once you're in business, how do you contract? How do you become eligible for those larger contracts and make sure you are on that competing edge? Um, I just really appreciate your um, sharing with us today these resources. And for, for me, what I notice is there's a lot of choices. Businesses have choices. But if you don't know where the resources are, it's going to be harder. So your job, all of you today, is share what you learned today with your friends and your colleagues and other business owners and let them know that these leaders in this room are here. Um, I also want to just make sure you know that this will be recorded. We're going to send the PowerPoints to those of you who uh, registered and attended. And I also just want to do a shout out to our library partners, Jay, um, community college partners. There are a lot of different organizations that are here to support businesses. It's, it's not just one, but if you have a question, call these people, let them know what your questions are and help them be a resource for you. So I was going to, uh, if it's okay, to ask a question of these panels and just jump in uh, when you're ready to answer. Um, we just have a few, um, about a half an hour left and I have a bunch of questions. Um, the first question is really, so what are some of the best daily, monthly practices the business owner can do to stay healthy financially? Go for it. Y'all see I'm sitting here eating popcorn. This stuff so good. Get it done, girl. This is some good information, okay? So listen, the best thing that you can do to help your business stay healthy is to constantly, I heard Beto say, I like marketing. I like, you know, customer fulfillment. I don't like them numbers. I don't like finance, right? The things that you don't like, you still have to do. You can't ignore it and think that it's going to go away. You have to do it. So in my opinion, the best thing you can do to keep your business healthy is to just look at the numbers. Even if you don't understand, I tell my clients all the time, look at them and see if there's a change. If one month it was $10 and the next month is 300, right there, just circle it. And then look up, what, is, what does this number mean? What is this ratio? I don't understand it. And then you can start to identify patterns and say, okay, well, if the none of the numbers change, then I guess I'm doing okay, right? But look at your numbers, make sure that your numbers are something that you're constantly monitoring, even if you don't understand it. That's my advice. Beautiful. Go ahead, Beto. So totally agree, Jennifer Ness. I will even go to a next step of budgeting. So if you don't know your budget as individual, like personal budgeting, it's so important as a small business owner or solopreneur. Like if you don't know how you are much you pay for rent, gas, electricity, enjoy like haircut, manicure, pedicure, like all those things that you want, personal start with, and then transfer all that into your business, same budgeting. Uh, budgeting is key for financial freedom and also wealth generation. So yes, you can be, and if for me, it's always like that. It's like, no, I cannot save money for buying a house. So I cannot save money to get there. I totally understand. Sometimes it's like a lot of challenges that you, that you are facing, but understanding your numbers start at home, personal, and then match it to your business. And then the intersectional between both. And that's how you are gonna achieve financial freedom in both aspects, personal and business, because sometimes we just disconnected. So that's my advice. And if you get intimidated, if you don't know how to do it, so uh, I will highly suggest to find someone who help you. And there's a lot of people out there that they can help you. Thank you for that. Um, I um, wanted to just also, anyone else on the panel want to answer that question? Risa or Cecile? I just want to reiterate what um, um, Beto had mentioned is know your numbers. Yeah. Uh, 
the and the key really is to provide for yourself in this business first and then thrive. Um, because if you if you cannot upkeep your own um, basic living needs, that business will fail because you will struggle to make the right decisions for everybody involved. Lovely. Yeah, and when, when we say numbers, it means actually put on a spreadsheet what money comes in and what money goes out. And if you can spend any time on a cash flow, oh, it will be a freeing experience. Um, so one, one question that I want to ask all of you experts is, what is your best advice for someone just starting out who's got an excellent product or service, but they haven't really formalized their business yet. And I know, Jennifer S., you gave us like the 10 best credibility priorities. Anyone else want to share about those who may be on this call who are just getting started? I'd be happy to say something if Maurice or Jennifer S. or Cecile. Go for I it. just want to make sure that I, we, I, we give enough space to everybody to talk. But I mean, for me, startups are very, that's kind of like I start up many businesses over my life and I have a good experience and bad experiences, but all of them, they're learnings. So be frugal. So when I say frugal means like, don't go over the top when you're starting something, just try and make sure that your product, your service, it's good to be sustainable, at least short, long term. And before you start getting excited and getting a very expensive truck or a very expensive tool materials, I have seen many clients, of course, that they come and say, I want to spend $20,000 in this build up. And I say, uh uh, so where are you going to buy all that? And, and they want to start all this fancy furniture and say, what about IKEA? What about this? What about that? And then it's all, and then from twenty thousand we reduce it to five thousand or two thousand, and then it's a better way to start. So if you're a startup, really don't spend all your savings on it. Even though you have a solid business plan, uh, and then you think that it's going to do really well, don't spend all your money. Uh, so what I say, be frugal, means be intentional about how you spend every penny on your startup. And then as soon as you start getting all this excitement then you can start spending more money. But that's my advice. And I have learned hard times for going very expensive, like very fancy and expenses. Love it. Love it. Marisa, you had an idea. I did. You know, it's very important to know what your product is worth. It's also important to research other companies that are comparison to your company to know that you have the structure that you need to know that you are actually advertising it correctly and to know that you you actually are pricing it out in comparison to the other the other companies that are providing the same kind of product. Lovely. Jennifer Ness, you had a night you had a suggestion. Well, Lisa, I have so many. <laughs> No, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to be the one that was just kept talking, but I do want to say, make sure you have a solution, right? Entrepreneurs are problem solvers. If you're not solving a problem, you just want to start a business because, you know, your grandmama make the best pies in the whole wide world. And you think everybody want pies. Think about it. Is that really a solution? You know, maybe that's a novelty and maybe people will buy your pies, but it depends on what your goals are. So start with the end in mind. So if I want to make ten thousand dollars a month how much time do i really need to put into making pies how many pies do i need to sell what's my bottom line what's my break even so think about those numbers think about the the end result and then back it all the way up right and understand that you need to have a solution and find the folks who have your problem and then market to them stop marketing to everybody i see that all the time where people are like Oh, I sell shoes. I'm going to sell shoes to anybody who has feet. Uh, no, that's not the way that works. Okay. <laughs> so make sure that you're solving a problem. You know, the folks who have your problem and you market specifically to them. That's, that would be my advice. Love it. Love it. So um, for those businesses that are in business now and they're, they're, they're doing their work um, and they are 
regularly tracking expenses and income, everything seems to be easier. You know, they're filing their taxes, they're able to apply for these PPP loans, they've got some contingency planning, uh, but if they don't have all of this together, um, Beto, do you and Marisa with Business Impact Northwest and obviously Jennifer Ness and, and Tabor, do you, do you work with businesses that are already established, that already have their business license and their DUNS number, but they're not really quite uh, they don't have everything together yet, or do you just work with startups? Um, I make a living off of businesses that are established but are still messy. <laughs> messy. Tell yeah. us more about that. What is? What are you? What are you talking about? I mean that um, you uh, you've been doing the bookkeeping yourself, right? And then maybe there's some things that are have been missed. Um, you've. Uh, you're, you're attempting everything in the book that you possibly can just to get that next IRS deduction, but you don't know what the next level is, right? Or you're trying to keep, and you're trying to um, maintain your employees and staff um, and retain them. And you don't know what other benefit you can give them, what other value you can give them other than they must, uh, that um, you're their buddy and you're their boss, right? Um, those little things that take a, a growing company to that next level as well as satisfy that need to be have um, business owner financial empowerment and independence and create beyond you and the company a legacy for your family and their families. Great, love it. Um, I appreciate that. That's it's um, it's a treacherous uh, track, and I think this is one of the questions that um, we had one person uh, ask. You know, our organization recently is that when a business is doing well, and they've got more business than they know what to do with, and they're ready, they're ready to like jump, to expand, to get a loan and hire more people or buy a truck. Sometimes they'll get a loan and that, that valley of death will uh, consume them. So my question to you all is, how do you help people who are in business, who are, are feeling that growth and they're ready to expand? What, what advice can you tell um, folks in that situation? Um, I just would say, absolutely get a coach. Get a coach, get a business advisor, most of the folks on this line right here offer free business advising. So you can contact the Washington Small Business Development Center. You can contact Ventures. You can contact um, Tabor 100. You can contact Business Impact Northwest. You can contact Jay over at the Seattle Public Library. Just get a coach and understand what your growth looks like. I talk to people every day and they're like, I have this money that's sitting in the bank. I really don't know what to do with it. I've paid myself. Do I give myself a bonus? Like, how do I budget this? And I'm like, what is it that you want to do? Like, how do you want to grow your business? So sometimes you won't know that because you're so busy working in the business that you don't know how to work on the business. And so having a coach will be that third eye for you to say, oh, you're doing this really, really well. How about you pivot to doing this? Or how about you streamline and stop doing this and just focus on this? And so having a coach is super duper important. At the uh, small plug, at the Small Business Development Center, we have... 30 business advisors, certified business advisors across the state of Washington. Absolutely no cost business advising that goes with some of these other organizations. So we can sit down and actually help you develop a strategy for growth. Somebody asked in the chat, and I'll just answer this real quick. Is it a good idea to borrow money to start a business? In my opinion, no. You should only borrow money to grow your business. You have to have some type of sustainability before you start to borrow money. You need to know if this is a viable business and that you can actually make money from it before you go borrowing money and have to pay somebody back for something that may not be successful. So in a growth phase and a growth strategy, absolutely. If you need borrow, to borrow money to get to the next level, absolutely. But to start off, I would say no. And that's just my opinion. But I saw that in the chat box. Thank you, Jennifer Ness. How about, how about others on the panel? 
Yes, we definitely offer resources and coaching at no judgment. Um, even if your business is, is moving steady and strong, it never hurts to have another set of eyes look over what you have going on. Um, it, it may improve it for you. Yeah, and about the startup, I know that there's many uh, perspectives about getting a loan when you're just starting up. You know, Jennifer has said, hold off till you're moving. I know there's others on the panel who have another perspective. Um, Beto, do you do you want to speak to that? Yes, uh, I totally um, agree with Jennifer Ness of like start lean and frugal. I always do that, but I also want us to think about like entrepreneurship is always being for people who have wealth. So starting a business or something is not really part of the the opportunity or economic opportunity that my community get access. So I always want to challenge us to think about what is the capital that we need to create to support these individuals. Because many of the times you don't have the luxury of start with a loan or a savings or something. So you need to, you have a good product, you have a good service, but you need those $5,000 to buy tools. And that's what ventures exist or impact business impact Norwest or CDFIs, community development financial institutions to take more risk on the banks. So of course, we don't want the or loans go south because that doesn't help our organization and that doesn't help the client. But we will do everything at least adventures to be possible to restructure, to help you to make sure that the loan doesn't go south, even if it's a startup. So we have micro loan program from 1,000 to 5,000 for startups that is approved in internally that doesn't have to go to a loan committee that it has a very low barrier, very competitive interest, that basically they are approved by me and another two members of my team. And we take huge risk, huge risk. Like so many times, like nobody will approve that loan, to be honest. But um, let me tell you, 98% of our loans are pre prepaid, like they're payback. So our rate of repayment is super high because the technical assistant and the training and the coaching and the adapting to support these startups. So they are in communication with us like Beto, things are going really bad or with their business coach. How do we restructure? How do we put you? And we're not here in the business of making money as the financial institutions. We're here to help people to move out of poverty by owning a business and generate wealth. So I think that's kind of my perspective, but I agree with Jennifer Finesse as a business financial advisor, no, but also it's opportunities out there that they can help you to start something. So I can talk about this for hours because even like access to grants is my next thing that I want to challenge our government to get capital to these businesses that they don't have to go to a loan, but stay tuned because we're moving some, some things there. Thank you, both of you, for giving perspectives on both ends of that continuum. Very awesome. So I wanted to just shine a little bit of light on that magical thing called cash flow. It's one of my favorite things in the whole world. And once people get it, once people see that they don't have to have their worries right here, they can stretch out their worries in the long term. Uh, it's 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 a magical gift, and so it's not magical. It's practical. I'm just wondering if if one of you can, or many of you, can share about your 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 feelings about cash flow projections, using them, why they're important. Tell us about like what they are. Go for it. I I really only have one little tidbit for everybody. Is the cash flow projection is not a set it and forget it type of thing. You you have to revisit it often um, and make adjustments. Um, it, it should be an ongoing event for your company is to revisit that cash flow, make sure that you're on budget and on target. Lovely. So for those of you who don't know about a cash flow projection, give it to us, Jennifer Ness. You know, I love when you call my name, right? No, <laughs> I have to do it. So um, one of the things that we help with at the Small Business Development Center is to help you guys to put together cash flow projections. Any 
anybody that asks that is going to give you money wants to know what are you going to do with it so that's simply all it does it shows here's the money i have coming in here's what i'm going to spend it on it helps you as much as it as it helps them so when you create those cash flow projections it's almost like what beto said about budgeting it's looking at here's where my numbers are going to and then you can kind of identify oh man i'm gonna have a i'm gonna have a really low month in march of 2022. So because I'm going to have a low month in March of 22, maybe there's a marketing campaign I can I can deploy or maybe I can cut some of my expenses down because I look I'm looking at all these numbers and I see that in this month it's going to be in the red. Maybe not the bottom line is going to be red, but maybe the top line is going to be red. So you can do some things. So having financial projections help you to plan accordingly and we can help you put those together. Some people get intimidated when the bank says, I need two years of financial projections. They're like, oh my God, I'll never have that. It's not that serious, okay? It is not that serious. It's not that hard. It's something that you need to do anyway, even if the bank doesn't ask you for them. Put together your financial projections. You don't need a spreadsheet. You can put it on a piece of paper if you want to. It's not, don't be intimidated by these little things. And I know that folks are intimidated because I talk to folks every day. So that's why I'm telling you guys, don't be intimidated. Know that it's something that you can do. It's simple, but just like um, Cecile, uh, man, Cecile said, it's something that you need to look at, right? Maybe even quarterly. I helped clients with their financial projections for the first quarter. Guess what? In the second quarter, we can go back and identify how did you meet them? Did you meet them or do we need to adjust them? And if so, let's just get it done. It's just a matter of plugging in numbers differently. So financial projections and cash flow statements, super duper duper important. And it's something that anybody on this panel can help you with and probably would like to do it. Even though Beto said he don't like numbers, he liked that. No. <laughs> well, I say I don't like it, but I have to. I run an organization that I need to look on my PL, my profit and loss, my cash yeah. flow, and I have to be very fiduciary. So I will just add another thing. I know there is another questions, but Think about like when you are balancing your checkbook. So start there. Like if you don't even know how to do your own bank account, of start there. That's the, the first step when you are owning a business because if you don't know how much money you have in your bank account and you're still going to buying things and you can write a check, they are gonna your bank is gonna charge you every time that you go an overdraft, right? We don't want that because that's bad financial literacy. So start there and do that active. Check your bank account personally. I always like to go to the very basics. And then if you learn all those things, you are going to, no matter how complicated and sophisticated and how many zeros have after, if you have the formula on how do you manage that, you are going to be able to balance how much money that you have in your account. So other thing, it's pretty sad when your business is going to be successful, but you didn't plan ahead. Yeah. You say, I'm going to need $10,000, but really what you need is 15. And then when you get to the 10,000, you don't have more money to pay your rent and your utility and your employees. But you, when you were going to get to the month, 12 or 13, you are going to be able to be successful, but you didn't get there because you didn't plan your cash flow and your PL, your profit and loss. I have seen that many times. It happened to me before, to be honest, as an entrepreneur, and it was pretty sad to unplug it, close it, lose it, everything. And if I would have five more months, I would have probably been able to keep the business. And I have that I've been in that situation. So financial, super important. I divided marketing, financials, and operations. So those are the three core things on your business. Beautiful, beautiful. And the other thing I know about cash flow is when you can see your sales and your expenses, you can, you have power, you have choices to reduce your expenses or increase your sales or, and you can see it over time. It's, it's a, it's a huge relief. Um, I love it. Jay just said, what about cash flow as a way to tell your story about your business? Love it. Love it. So we just have time for a couple more questions. If you're open, I'm going to do one question here. And that is many businesses uh, were shut out of the PPP loans and other federal loans and state grants 
because they didn't have their financial statements together or accounting practices that made it easy. A lot of folks can't afford QuickBooks, but Jennifer S. gave us a, um, a clue as to a free resource that you can use. So if you can just talk about the mindset, you all alluded a little bit before, you know, you like to do your art, but doing the business part isn't good. What, 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 can, what, I, what ideas can you give to people about the mindset they need to, to give them the peace to do their finances every month or every day so they know how they're doing? Marissa, we want to hear from you. I mean, y'all know I could talk all day long. <laughs> it's important to stay on top of your finances. It's, an, it's important to keep your documentations together to know what your company is worth, what you brought in. That way you don't have to be stuck in the dilemma of not being able to apply for a PPP loan. Um, it, 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 it was some uh, very small requirements. Uh, we're still actually still processing PPP loans at this point in time. And um, really it, it just boiled down to, did you have a tax return that we can see your, your net growth off of in order to get you processed? And a lot of people didn't have that. So it is definitely important to stay on top of your, your financial stability and your documentations to know what you're worth, what you brought in, in order to apply for these loans. Great. And I don't know, Beto, if you had an, wanted to share. Yeah, I, I think it, I agree. It's very important, but intimidating. So how do you start? What are the templates? What even like, what does Web Ventures create a program in whole Spanish? Because even like if some individuals who are now English proficient, at least they start in Spanish first, and then when then you have to transfer into, into English, it's easier. So it's just intimidating, but I swear that as soon as you know how to do it, it's actually exciting to see it every month and see, okay, I, I, I did good this month and this marketing campaign is kicking butt. And then this is making an impact in my business. So it's like kind of like a, the bones of your business. I think financials are the bones what they really sustain your business. But if you don't see it and dedicate at least a couple hours a week on your finances. I agree. And again, like I'm saying, I'm not a lover of financing, <laughs> like all of that. And I'm an executive director. I have someone who helped me to do all that, an amazing person, my associate director, Laura Fletcher. But I have to know because if I don't know, how do I know that my team is doing the right thing? So I do highly recommend to make that investment and also will help you to create generational wealth that I think that's what many people want. How do you invest your money, Jennifer, and I say earlier, like I have all this money on the bank account and I don't know how to put it to work. It's gonna be to a point that you maybe say, I want to invest in the stock market or maybe I want to buy another house or maybe I want to do this and that. And then unfortunately we have not been taught how to do that because yeah. that's not economic opportunity for our communities. And that's what, the panelists here are we're here because we are doing that work to make sure that our community understand how to do that generational wealth. So Jennifer, as I see that you unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to back up one thing that Beto said. He said he has someone to do it for him, even the things he doesn't like to do. And guys, we should get to that point. If you don't like to do it, it still has to be done. <laughs> so hire somebody. There are folks that will help you to do certain things. Farm them out if you need to, but they have to be done. It's not something you can ignore and it'll go away, right? Most times when you ignore problems, they grow. So find somebody who can help you. I know, for example, like your Office of Economic Development, sometimes they will pay for you to have an accountant, not saying that you all need an accountant. Some of you may not need an accountant, you might just need a bookkeeper, right? So hire someone to help you understand them. Come to these classes. I just put in the chat box, all the classes that we have coming up, fund your business growth. We're gonna be talking about to answer some of the questions in the chat box. I believe Deborah asked, are there grants for startups? What kind of money is for startups? Okay, we're gonna help you fund your business growth. Another one, upgrade your business entities. This is a real huge problem in our community. 
Some folks have the wrong business entity, so they don't qualify for certain things. So making sure that you have the proper business entity so you can qualify for certain contracts and certifications and things that you want to grow your business. So that's another class, another webinar, another panel that we have coming up. So make sure that you are aware of those. They're in the chat box, register. But these things are readily available to you. And most of our, I mean, I wouldn't say most, all of our classes are no cost. The library does classes, SCORE does classes. You know, all of these organizations have all of these classes to teach you the things that you don't know, right? And to connect you with those resources. So make sure you're staying connected to those resources. Beautiful, beautiful. I know we have a couple of questions here. One is, do you have to have a business license uh, in order to start? Um, and then another question is, um, do you, uh, there's a person, Deborah, wants to open um, a cooperative. And I'll just say that the Northwest Cooperative Development Center is um, an MDO partner with WSMA. And they're excellent at supporting uh, cooperatives that get started uh, around the state. All right, so, um, oh, also great. Social Purpose Corporations, excellent suggestion there. Thank you, Jay. So we have just a few minutes left. Are there any burning questions for our panelists before we let everyone go? You can put it in the chat. While they put this question in the chat, I have this last question. So some of us don't think we have a budget for advisors, but we may have an uncle or an aunt or a niece who is a lawyer or a cousin who is a bookkeeper. What advice would you give to beginning entrepreneurs or existing entrepreneurs who don't have that business team of folks who are there at their side, who can test ideas with? How would you develop your, your, your support team? Marisa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it kind of goes back to what Jennifer Ness was saying, you know, it's important to have a coach, to find a coach, to find some resources that can help you get up on your feet, get your plan together. So that way you're going to see, that way you can be successful. Um, it's important to have, you know, that support system. So definitely look out for our resources at Business Impact Northwest that can assist you on making your, your business successful. I would also add that if you have a cousin, you know, a lot of us don't have those folks. And in my community, we don't have those lawyers and accountants and CPAs, you know, at our disposal. If you have it, use it, right? And also get back to bartering. You may have something that you can barter with, right? Your services, your products, right? And so get back to that. Like if, if you have an accountant, for example, when I was running my business full time, I didn't really pay for a whole lot of anything. I didn't, get, I didn't pay to get my eyebrows done, my nails done, all of my little services, those folks are my clients. And so we bartered services all the time. And so people want to do that. They're entrepreneurs just like you. They're no different from you, right? And so they know that you have something that they can use. Bartering is excellent. It's an excellent way for, of commerce. And we need to get back to that, especially in our communities, right? We need to buy from each other, support each other, use each other's services. And this is how we do that. And I'm not saying don't pay because, and don't ask for no discount either. Pay <laughs> folks and don't be asking for a discount. <laughs> I would also say you can also learn from them as well, just the way they move, how they interact with people and how they do their bar bartering services. Give you some ideas, you know, on how to conduct your business. Lovely. Lovely. I know we have just a few minutes. Would you do me a favor, all of you? Would you just put what's inside of you right now? What's alive in you about hearing all of this about finances and cash flow? What moved you about this program today? And just stick it in the chat. And I'm just going to say connected, inspired. What moved you today in this program? I still have a lot to learn. Learning, connected. Yeah, I know for me, I, uh, I'm blown away by the leaders in this room and not just those who spoke, 
but all of you who are in here, education is power. There's guidance. Education is out there. You're not alone. Reach out. Awesome. Excellent resources. Really thankful for the seven credibility factors. Awesome. Motivated. I feel at ease in my startups. Credibility is key. Awesome. I just want to have you all take off your, put your, put your cameras on. And I want you to just give a very powerful, take off your, you know, unmute yourself. And let's give everybody who was a panelist today a broad <laughs> applause. Beautiful, beautiful job. You are all awesome. Now listen, don't, don't stop here. Next month, Jennifer S. In May. In May, we have um, Upgrade Your Business Entity. So if you're in the wrong business entity, we have a certified public accountant that's going to be doing a panel discussion. We'll have um, some guests that talks about how their business entity was not the right one for them. We'll have uh, Lewis Rudd, who is the CEO of Ezell's Chicken. We'll have Samantha Neal, who is the owner of um, Coastal Maintenance Solutions. And we'll have Sean Harju, who was an attorney at Chrysalis. And they're just going to talk about how being in the wrong business entity could really hinder your business and your growth. And then we'll have the CPA to answer your specific questions. I put that in the chat. There it is, Giselle. Thank you so much. And then in, in August, we have Fund Your Business Growth. And so we had a lot of questions about if you're a startup, what should you do? If you're an existing, existing business and you're trying to grow, what should you do? There's certain business entities and lenders that you should never go to. Depending upon the stage of your business, you should not be walking into a bank and asking for money because it's probably not going to happen, right? You probably want to use a CDFI like Ventures or uh, Business Impact Northwest or Craft3 or Evergreen Business Capital. Those may be the best resources for you. Also, different ways to build credit like, you know, trade accounts and things like that. So all of this information is readily available. Check out um, BOBE 2021. Giselle, can you put that in the chat, please? At this website is a list of all the different training that's going on all across the state of Washington to help you grow your business. So you can go to that website and look at specific training. It's updated almost every day. And every anything that's going on for small business owners, we are putting it there. So you don't have to go all around and, and uh, subscribe to everybody's distro list. You can go to this website and see all the different training that's available to support you and your business growth, okay? All right, Giselle thank just, you so much for that plug, Lisa. Oh my gosh, and Giselle just put in the list. If you have an event going on, you can put it on the calendar. Um, this is an incredible opportunity for everybody. I'm super honored to be um, hosting today. Thank you, all of you. Beto Yarse from Ventures, Marisa Phyllis from Business Impact Northwest, Jennifer Ness from the SBDC, an incredible Cecile and Anthony from uh, Table 100. Awesome, awesome, awesome job. You make my heart sing. Have a great day, everybody.